Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. If you're a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, then the Lord has a plan for you in His church, and His Spirit will equip you and enable you to accomplish His unique purpose for you in your life. And today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be studying Paul's teaching about spiritual gifts and how they enable us to fulfill our role among Christ's people in the church body. So welcome to the Key Chapters podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And this is our daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of the Bible. And today we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and spiritual gifts. We've got a lot to cover. Let's jump on in. Now, as we start chapter 12, until now, we've gone through a long section of difficult material. Paul's been dealing with division of the Corinthian church over things like following one teacher over another, uh, matters of sin and church discipline, disunity over things like dietary laws and head coverings. Now we turn to things like spiritual gifts and love and how we can all work together. So chapter 12, verse 1 opens with a phrase. This is a familiar phrase. It says, now concerning. Now, that probably means that Paul is working down this list of questions and issues that the Corinthian church had written him about, and now Paul's moving on to the issue of spiritual gifts. And it's possible that people in Corinth were claiming that they had some spiritual gift that they didn't have, or maybe they were claiming because they had a specific spiritual gift, they were more important in the church than someone else. And so Paul starts out these opening verses here, letting these folks know that not everything said in the church is edifying or of the Lord. And so in verse 2, before they came to Christ, they were led astray in their pagan worship. They need to be on guard against that same kind of being led astray happening to them now that they're in the church. And so in verse 3, he gives them some guidance for how to tell if a person's actually of the Lord. So he says, no one who says Jesus is accursed is of the Lord. We can pretty much agree to that. And he says, those who say Jesus is Lord is of the Lord. That's by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think that Paul is trying to give them some kind of hard and fast test here, but rather he's giving them principles of of what to be looking for. Are are these teachers seeking to edify the people in Christ as citizens of Christ's kingdom? Are they calling the people to be more surrendered to Jesus? Or are they giving really the message of this world? Jesus is a curse. Like he, he was hung on a cross. That's what God does with people who are cursed. You don't have to follow him. Stick with us and stick with our thing and, and just don't worry about the Jesus stuff any longer. And so if they're teaching that way, they're not the Lord. Don't listen to him. Now let's keep on going, talking about spiritual gifts, getting to verse four here. In verse four, Paul wants us to know that the Holy Spirit does indeed work in the church and we should be expecting him to work and looking for his work and embracing his work, joining in his work. And so in verse four, the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. In verse five, the Holy Spirit fills our ministries. In verse six, the Holy Spirit is the one who causes the results. And so the work of the church is to be the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the point that Paul is making here is that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to all believers. Now, they're not talents. They're not skills. They're not personal hobbies. It's it's not like a person saying, well, I like to paint and therefore I have the spiritual gift of artistry. That may be a God-given talent and it may be useful for the work of the Lord, but it is not a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is the spiritual ability to accomplish a spiritual result. I'll say that again. A spiritual gift is a spiritual ability to accomplish a spiritual result. And so when it comes to us trying to figure out what gifts God has given to us, we should be looking for what accomplishes spiritual results in our work in the church. And so a spiritual gift is the spiritual ability for us to join in God's work in this world. God gives spiritual gifts to everyone because everyone who is truly born again has a role in God's kingdom work in this world. And so for the next several verses, Paul then explains what these gifts are. However, before we get to that point, I I just want to cover some more background information on the purpose of spiritual gifts. We just mentioned that verses 4 to 6 show us that spiritual gifts are the work of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the ministry of the church. Now, what is this ministry? We have to understand this. It's fulfilling the great commission that Jesus gave back in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. The Great Commission can be summarized as reaching and teaching. We're to reach this world for Christ and teach those who believe in Christ about Christ so they can carry on Christ's mission and further reach this world for Christ. And so the Lord gives the people of the church spiritual gifts to accomplish this mission. Some gifts will edify the church to understand God's truth for their own edification. Other gifts will edify the church to proclaim God's truth to the world. Other gifts will just enable the church to serve one another and function and be a healthy, joyful church family. 
But all spiritual gifts will align ultimately under these main headings of either reaching or teaching or doing both. Now, to accomplish this, the Lord has established the church as a living organism, a community of God's people who gather together to learn from the Lord, to worship Him, and to do His work in this world while we wait for His return. And so to do this, the Lord has given the church a spiritual union as brothers and sisters in Christ who join together in Christ's work. And so then in this passage, Paul is describing this organism, this this new being, as a body, a body that has to have diversity and unity so that various people can be fulfilling various roles in accomplishing Christ's work. And so these gifted people work together in cooperation with one another and in submission to the Lord, and they ultimately accomplish His will for that specific local church. And so that means then, we can't make up our own gifts. We can't decide which gifts we get. We can't do whatever we want with them. We need to know how the Lord has gifted us, and we need to know how to use them in submission to Christ and be filled with His Holy Spirit and enabled by His grace to do the work He has called us to do. And so a healthy church is made up of many different parts under the authority of one head who is accomplishing His work for His purposes of edification and evangelism. So with all of that as just kind of some side material, now let's look at verse 7 here and see how Paul unpacks these ideas throughout the rest of this passage. So going on to verse 7, Notice the source of these spiritual gifts. Paul says, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And so here we see that each one of us has been given this spiritual work for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And so each one of us, every one of us has received a spiritual gift. It is the work of grace. It's not something we earn. It's something that God gives to us. That being said, I think that when Paul says down in verse 31 that we should earnestly desire the greater gifts, I think that that means our gifting may change, especially as we seek to serve Christ. And so the Holy Spirit's giving us these gifts to serve the common good. But notice here that they are the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, the Holy Spirit will be working through us to manifest himself to those around us. And so they're also for the common good. These gifts are not for ourselves or really not even for our own enjoyment, though we probably will enjoy working with them and serving with them. And they're definitely not for our own pride. They are for the common good, to manifest the Holy Spirit in the life of the church so that we can carry out together the ministry and the mission of the Lord. So what are these gifts? Well, in verses 8 and 9, the Holy Spirit manifests himself with things like wisdom, knowledge, faith. Wisdom is the spiritual knowing and understanding of God's word, uh, God's wisdom, God's ways, and how to live life according to those truths. Knowledge is the spiritual ability to know and understand God's truth. Some scholars would say this is a gift that's actually revelation, kind of like prophecy. Either way here, it's certainly knowing and understanding God's word. Faith is the spiritual ability to take God at his word and live in light of it. And so to me, it seems like these gifts are all work together. We, we learn and know God's word. We understand how to apply God's word. And then we step out in faith and live what we know and see to be true. Now, in this verse here also, Paul mentions the gift of healing. That's the ability to cause an instantaneous healing in a person. This gift was temporary for the early church, and it was designed to convince people that indeed this message was the message of God, and it was true. And and that even aligns with the other gifts mentioned in verse 10, because these are also temporary gifts that were just designed to manifest and demonstrate the reality of God's truth. And so in verse 10, Paul mentions miracles. That's when a person is able to perform supernatural acts based on the power of God, again, to show the reality of God's presence and his power over laws of nature and even over the rule of Satan. Prophecy there is the ability to proclaim God's message. The gift of distinguishing of spirits is determining if someone is being used by God to speak his message or if that person is just blowing smoke. The gift of various kinds of tongues is miraculously speaking in different languages And the gift of interpretation of tongues is miraculously understanding different languages. Now, these are the gifts that Paul lists in verses 8 to 10. But down in verse 28, Paul lists several other gifts. So let's talk about those two all in one place here. Going down to verse 28, Paul also lists apostles, prophets, teachers, gifts of miracles, healings, helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. Now, we've just mentioned some of these, so I'll cover the ones we haven't covered yet. Apostles were initially the men commissioned by Jesus to bring his message into the world. Now, local churches would then commission and send out other apostles who functioned basically as missionaries. They didn't hold the same apostolic office as Peter and John and Paul and those guys, but they were still bringing God's message to the world around them. They were sent by the church. Teachers were those who were in the local churches helping the people understand the message of God and how to live according to his word. 
helps, the gift of helps, just the gift of helping one another through practical means like mowing lawns or doing dishes or things like that. And finally, administration is the gift of being able to steer something along a wise and godly and faithful course of action in submission and obedience to the Lord. And so these here, these are actually just some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are others still to go. In, in key passages like Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4 all talk about these other gifts. And I hope to get to those passages as we work through this podcast throughout the rest of this year. Anyway, so Paul's got a lot more to say about spiritual gifts. So let's keep going in this passage, going back to verses 11 and 12. In verses 11 and 12, Paul says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. And Paul's point here is that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts in such a way that allows for all of the people to work together as one body. This is another reason why I think that a person's gifting might change over time. If someone's to be part of a church and there's a gift that's needed but doesn't exist for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit's going to give somebody else, some faithful servant, that new gift so that body has what it needs. It's another reason why we should also be faithful with our gifts because if we're faithful, the Holy Spirit will say, hey, there's a guy, there's a gal, they're faithful with their gifts right now, and if I give them this new gift, I know they'll be faithful to this gift as well. And so he's more inclined to give us the gifts when we're being faithful to, to him, to serve him. Now let's go into verse 13. Uh, verse 13 is a, is a critical verse here because it's often quoted and we need to understand what it's saying. Paul says in verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made a drink of one Spirit. Now, what's Paul talking about here, and why does he drop this right here into this discussion about spiritual gifts? Well, Paul is trying to show us here how every believer, every true born-again believer, is a part of the body of Christ. So the word baptize here, it goes back to the main meaning of this word. It means to immerse. It's not talking about a literal water baptism here. It's talking about the fact how we've all been taken out of our old lives and placed into Christ. And so Paul is saying that every born-again believer is, by definition, immersed or absorbed into the body of Christ, and, and no true believer has not been baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. And yet, this baptism isn't something we can see. It's the spiritual union of the believer to Christ and Christ's people, and so we should be expecting, if we're all united together, we'll be working together. If anything, that's what you can see. A person who's been baptized into Christ works within the body of Christ. Well, the next several verses, as in verses 14 to 25, uh, they make for a fun reading, but for time's sake, I'm just going to summarize Paul's point here. Since the church is the body of Christ, no one should complain about what role they have in this church body. The foot is just as necessary as the hand. The ear is just as important as the eye. We can't all be the same thing. There needs to be diversity, but that's the beauty of God's design. There is beauty in the diversity. And even those gifts that seem weak or even insignificant, they're important and they have a role and they should be cherished. And verse 18 is key where Paul says, but now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. The Lord put these people in the church as he desires with the gifting he chooses. Therefore, we should submit to his choice, be humble about it, be grateful for the gifts he's given to us and unite together. Now, building on this idea of the need for unity and contentment with our gifts, Verses 25 and 26 say, So that there may be no division in the body. Remember, we've been talking about division a lot lately. He's still calling for unity here. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And so we hear this passage quoted a lot. We talk about, you know, one person suffering. If they suffer, we all suffer. And that's true. But that's not just an emotional statement. It's a practical, real statement. On the one hand, if someone's not doing well, if they're suffering, we need to minister to that person because we're all part of the same body. We're here to care for one another. And so you think about it. If you bash your big toe, it hurts to do just about anything. So you got to take care of it. And so we need to take care of those who are suffering. On the other hand, if someone has a gift and they're not using it, that's also going to affect the whole church family because God has designed that person to be a part of that church, to function together in unity with the rest of the church and to accomplish his work. And so every person in the church needs to know their gifts and needs to use them in the context of the body of Christ. And that's how the church is going to be healthy. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's just try to wrap up with some concluding thoughts, even applying this to our own life here. First, question, 
Are you serving somewhere in the church? If you're not, you should be. And so find out what spiritual gifts the Lord has given you and use them in the context of the church. Now, though, if you are serving in the church, are you using your spiritual gifts in that work? Are you serving by the grace and the power of the Spirit, or are you serving in the strength of your flesh? You see, when we have spiritual gifts and they're the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our life in this church, this is your opportunity to have a front row seat in the work of God in you and through you in that church. And so are you submitting to him so that he can use you for his kingdom work? Now, you might be wondering, well, how do I know what my spiritual gifts are? I just got to go quick here, but real quick. For one thing, saturate what you're doing with prayer. If you're not praying for what you're doing, if you're not submitting that to the Lord before you're doing it, you're probably doing that in your own strength. And therefore, you're really not going to be seeing if the Holy Spirit's actually working through you. So be a person who's praying, be a person who's saturating the things you're doing in prayer. Likewise, when you do that thing, your service, your, your involvement, are you doing it out of worship to God? Is there a sense where you're seeking to glorify him in that work? If you're sweeping the floor, if you're putting away food after a potluck, are you doing it trying to glorify the Lord in that? If, if you're not doing it that way, well, it's probably, again, not work that's being filled with the Holy Spirit it may or may not be a spiritual gift. And so then finally, as far as finding your spiritual gifts, look for where the Holy Spirit is using you to produce true spiritual fruit that's clearly not manufactured. So much of what we do is just manufactured. It was going to happen anyway. Look for the places where the Lord has worked and produced spiritual fruit that's not of you, but definitely of Him. And so just for final thoughts here, every church needs its members to walk with the Lord who are surrendered to Him, who know their gifts, and who are intentionally seeking to join themselves with the work of the rest of the church under the leadership of the elders and ultimately under the direction and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, praise God for you. And if it's not, then I would encourage you to spend some time figuring out what your gifts are and using them to join with the work of your church. Well, we'll end things there. Thanks for listening. Have a great day and God bless.